Hi everyone, welcome back to our online service and this is our Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday service. And do, I do hope that you're having a good uh, longer weekend in the last couple of days and really more so that you're taking this time to remember Jesus, remember the power of His resurrection. And I'd like to begin this time of praying together looking at a couple of verses in 1 Thessalonians. This is chapter 4 verse 13 to 18. The caption for this uh, set of verses here in the New Living Translation is titled, The Hope of the Resurrection. Over here in verse 13, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. The hope of the resurrection. If you are a follower of Jesus, you ought to know this. Or maybe if you're not sure, well, just to remind us that Jesus, not just that He died, He rose again from the dead. He was resurrected. And when He was resurrected, He spent 40 days on this earth meeting up with all of His disciples. And the, the day that He was taken up into the sky, the disciples were looking at Him and an angel appeared to them to say that, hey, why are you looking there? This same Jesus will one day return in the same manner, coming from the sky, return in the same manner. And we are talking about this hope. Paul is referring to this hope about people who have gone before us, people in other translations, they say people who have fallen asleep. In verse 14, it goes on to say, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with Him the believers who have died. Jesus is coming back again. This is also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, whereby it talks about if Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is futile. If the, dead did not, if the dead will not be raised, then let us go and eat, drink and party. Forget about this faith. But God will be coming back with the believers who have died, who have gone before us. Verse 15, We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. Which means it's almost like there's an order. Jesus is coming back again with the people who have gone before us and then those who are left behind here, all right, those who are still here on this earth, for the Lord com Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. All right, first, the believers who have died will actually be taken up first and when the sounding of that trumpet comes in the blink of an eye, this will take place. Verse 17 says this, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. This is the hope of the resurrection. Even as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, this is just an encouragement for all of us to celebrate this hope that Jesus is coming again. Those who have gone before us will be raised, raised from the dead. That, that there's nothing to fear about death. In fact, death is something that we ought to celebrate. Just recently, an uh, uncle of mine passed on. He was 93. And for the family, it was a rejoicing because we know that he has faith in Jesus. We know, we know this hope of the resurrection. And so Paul ends with this, so encourage each other with these words, that there is the hope of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. As we remember Jesus today, encourage each other with this. Father, I pray that as we remember you, Jesus, as we remember what you have done, you went to the cross on Good Friday, you died for us. On the third day, you rose again. You are the resurrected Christ. And because of that, we can believe in you that we too will have a resurrected body those who have gone before us will be resurrected, will come with you on your return. And we wait in eager anticipation for your soon and coming return to us. If you are still here, Lord, we, we long to hear that trumpet call, the trumpet call to activate us, to be taken up into the clouds to be with you. And so Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, now I'm going to hand over the time to Pastor Josh for the time of meditation upon the Word of God. Hey, everybody, and welcome to our Resurrection Sunday service. So glad you're here with us online, enjoying the Word of God together. And we're going to continue in the book of Matthew and just keep going. I know it's a special Easter or Resurrection Sunday, but I'm going to show you how in the Word of God, 
Uh, so much of it points to this critical moment that we're celebrating this weekend, Jesus dying for us, uh, being in the ground three days on the third day, rising from the dead to show he conquered death, conquered hell, and could offer us new life. So we're jumping straight in from Matthew chapter 12. It says this, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. So he's on the Sabbath, they're walking through the grain fields, and some of his disciples start picking some of the grains and heads of the grain and eating them. Well, there's Pharisees watching them, and the Pharisees get mad about this because they're quoting uh, uh, the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments, uh, you, you know, honor the Sabbath. And they say, look, he's doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath. He seems to be working on the Sabbath. Uh, and Jesus responds to this. And why we're talking about this now is I want us to remember or to think about how law, how religion, how self-righteousness responds when Jesus is on the move. Often we think, well, religious people and godly people and people who kind of care about what the Old Testament or what the Bible says would obviously be really excited about Jesus, would want to connect to Jesus, would want to know about his message. Uh, but let's see how these guys respond, right? First, they're saying, look, these guys are doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath. Jesus is going to teach them and train them and move them towards the heart of why God gave certain rules and laws, not just the letters of those laws. He says this, uh, haven't you read what David did when his, in his, he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God. Uh, he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, that special bread that was not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat. Now, why did they eat it? One, the priest told them they could eat it. And two, they were starving and they were desperate. Okay. So what is God trying to teach us through sharing that story? He says this, or haven't you heard and read in the law and prophets that on the Sabbath duty, the temple, the, the, the priest have to still serve, right? So I tell you that something, someone and something even greater than the temple is here. So here's what Jesus is trying to say. Look, you're trying to follow the rules and that's, that's noble. That's a good thing. Those rules were put in place for a reason. Now you're actually making those rules more detailed. There were these things called fence laws. Fence laws were like, hey, there's one law, so, so in order to not break that law, let's put fences around that law so you don't even get close to the law. And Jesus' disciples are kind of breaking one of those fence laws. They're not really working. They're not out in the field like harvesting grain. They're just picking a few to eat, and that would be considered a fence law. It wasn't specifically written in the Old Testament. Uh, so the Pharisees are getting mad at them, but Jesus is saying, look, there's more important things here then your rules and regulations, you've added to my rules and regulations. In fact, the laws and rules and regulations of God were actually put in place for a very specific reason. He says this, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent for the son of man is Lord of Sabbath. Here's what God is saying and through Jesus or Jesus as God is saying. He's saying, when I give rules, when I give laws, the point is not for the laws. The meaning is not for the laws themselves. The laws exist for the good of people and the honor of God. So going on from there, uh, he went to the synagogue and there was a man there who had a shriveled hand and looking for a reason to bring charge against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now I find this interesting. The heart of these people is really being exposed here. They're not asking him uh, to heal this person because they care that he has a shriveled hand and they want to see him get healed. Honestly, they're not even caring because they're like, wow, it'd be cool to see a miracle. That'd be kind of fun. Or they want some religious experience. It says they want Jesus to heal someone. So they have a reason to bring a charge against Jesus. So Jesus, knowing their thoughts, responds to him this way. He says, look, if any of you had a sheep and it fell into a pit on a Sabbath, would you not take hold of it and lift it out? And the answer to that would be yes. How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? And I think that question actually got to them because here's the reality. Those Pharisees saw their own possessions, their own sheep, their own money, their own stuff as more valuable than someone else. It was more important to them to protect their sheep than it was to protect the man with the shriveled hand. And that's why Jesus says it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath, because it's never a bad idea to do what's right. It's never a bad idea to do what's right. And that's what Jesus is trying to get them back to. They completely misunderstood value. And so they would do what's right to their animals, but they wouldn't do what's right to another person. And so he challenges them. And then he turns to the man and says, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand and it was completely restored just as sound as the other. In other words, Jesus still did good. Now you might think the Pharisees would go, wow, you know what, man, we probably got it wrong there. Look at the guy he's healed now. Now he can be a productive member of society. Uh, he, look how happy he is, man. 
guys, you know, come on, let's get our hearts right and, and apologize to Jesus. No, they went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Their response to seeing the supernatural power of God, the compassion of God, the love of God was to desire to kill him. You know, when my number one goal is being right, then I'll win an argument at the expense of a relationship. When my number one goal is getting what I want, I'll destroy more valuable things like my relationship with God, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my kids or my friends uh, or the rest of my family. I'll destroy that in order to get what I want. And that's what's happening to these guys. And that's the danger of religious focus, self-righteousness, self-focus, is we actually destroy the things that are valuable, missing out on the power and the peace and the love that's right in front of our face. But Jesus is aware of their plan. So aware of this, he kind of gets out of that place, right? Because he's not uh, going to sit around and wait for them to kill him. So, uh, but this is classic Jesus, right? He's trying to get away. Large crowd follows him. So what is Jesus's response when a large crowd follows him? He heals everybody who's ill. That was happening so he could fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Jesus doesn't stop doing what's right just because it gets difficult. Jesus doesn't stop loving people just because some people didn't love him back. And here's what Isaiah said about him. He said, this is the servant of God who have I chosen, the one in whom God loves and whom he delights. God says, I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not raise quarrel or cry out, nor will he raise his voice in the streets. In other words, he's not there to self-aggrandize. He's not there to draw crowds to himself. The crowds followed him because he was so good, but he wasn't there drawing crowds to himself. In fact, he was acting very differently. It says that a bruised reed he would not break and a smoldering wick he would not snuff out. Uh, so if you know what a bruised reed is, I mean, it would look like something like this. It's a reed that's bent, it's, it's damaged, and therefore will never produce any fruit or harvest, okay? A smoldering wick is like the idea of a, of a match or a candle wick that has, it's smoking, but it's no longer on fire. So it's actually producing a negative thing, smoke, without being able to produce the good thing, light or heat or whatever else you need. It does have some heat, uh, but ultimately, uh, it would actually produce more negative than positive. And what it's saying is God and Jesus in his mercy, even someone who's, who's smoking all over the place, someone who makes the room smoky and coffee and hard. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where someone's changing the atmosphere for the negative. What this is saying is Jesus will be gentle and kind even with that person. Someone who's bent so bad that they cannot be productive anymore, Jesus will still love them. He won't damage them. He won't break them. And then very next verse, we see an example of Jesus living this out. It says they brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Now think about that. This is a person who can't really do anything to help people, and he's demon-possessed, so there's a danger of people who are around him. So what does Jesus do? He, in compassion and gentleness, heals him so that he can both talk and see. And all the people are astonished and said, could this be the son of David? Now watch again the Pharisees, the legalistic reaction to the love and compassion of Jesus. Jesus has just caused someone who's never been able to see to see, never been able to talk to talk. Their reaction? Oh, he's doing that because by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Once you've decided you hate somebody, rationality leaves. And these guys are not talking logic anymore. They're not talking religion anymore. They just hate Jesus. And no matter what he does, they're going to see it as a bad thing. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says this, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, is he divided against himself? How can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, he gets them on this one. Who do your people drive them out by? So let them be your judges. In other words, he drives out a demon. They actually had exorcists in the Jewish community who would cast out demons. And he's going, look, if the only way to cast out demons is demons, what are you saying about your own brothers over there? And then he dr really drives to the heart of this whole thing. And I think for this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, this celebration right now, what we're celebrating, we really have to decide this in our own hearts, in our own lives, in our own souls. If it's by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, Jesus said, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, guys, if this is real, which it is, if these miracles you're seeing are really happening, you need to understand and you need to repent. God has shown up. This is his kingdom. This is his spirit. And things are changing. Life is coming. Peace is replacing war. Love is replacing hate. All these things are happening because God's kingdom is coming. Now he says again, 
Uh, can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder the house. And we've used this a lot in sort of spiritual warfare and different terminologies. If I could just offer one devotional thought from this verse that hit me recently. You know, if I'm the head of my household, if I'm the strong man of my house, there's a limited ability for me to protect my home. I'm not as strong as I used to be, definitely. And I'm not that strong compared to a lot of people in the world. If our safety is built based on how much I can protect our home, it's kind of limited. But if God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the all-powerful God of the universe is the strong man in my house, that house is pretty safe. Nobody's going to bind him up. Nobody's going to tie him up. That place is going to be a place of safety and peace because they cannot plunder his house because he's too strong for that. But now Jesus goes on and says this, whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. So he's challenging them. Why are you pushing people away in the name of God when, when I am God? You should be drawing them to me. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Because this is going to be a critical factor. This is why Jesus cares so much. When you speak evil of the spirit, you're actually pushing people away from any chance they have to engage in an eternal relationship with God, to have that relationship with God, because that happens in our spirit. Jesus said he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And you come to him, uh, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So you need the Spirit of God to awaken you in your heart. That's why we were dead in our sins and transgressions. And then Jesus makes us alive so we can have a relationship with God. And he's saying, if you don't have that, you can't even be connected to the kingdom. So he says, that will never be forgiven you. Anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or the age to come. Uh, now, I do want to encourage you, if you've ever done that, because I had a friend who thought that was funny, read that verse in a, in a young childhood. He, he was like, oh, I'm going to do that. I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And he, ha, ha, ha. I, I want to balance something. The very fact that he was concerned he had hurt God and that he was unforgivable unfor by doing that told me that his heart wasn't seared enough uh, to mean that he wasn't forgiven of God. When we do things in ignorance, God's willing to forgive us. These are people who should have known better, who had seen Jesus in the flesh, who had seen Jesus doing miracles in the flesh. And they were attributing things that were obviously the Holy Spirit to things that, to, to, to Beelzebub, to de demons. And he was warning them off that choice because he's saying, if you make that choice, you're crossing a line you can't come back from. So how do we, if we're not sure if we did something like that in our past, what do we do? If you're even worried or listening to me right now and concerned, you might have done that. If you cry out to Jesus, I guarantee he'll forgive you because your conscience would be seared and you wouldn't even be asking for forgiveness unless he was still drawing you home. So just want to encourage you. With that. Now he goes on to say this make a good tree, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is obviously recognized by its fruit. So one of the good fruit we have sometimes is repentance, is recognizing we've done wrong and going, hey, I'm sorry, I want to change. That by itself is a beautiful fruit that shows we're turning back to God. Now Jesus ramps up his attack on these Pharisees right here and he calls them children of snakes. That's a bad one. You brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This is a huge lesson for me. The reason you want to give your heart to Jesus, the reason you want to let him put his word in your heart and his spirit in your heart and his love in your heart is because what comes out of your mouth is what your heart is full of. He says, a good man brings out good things out of his good stored up in him. An evil man brings out evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Uh, so how will you know someone's good or evil? by the words that come out of their mouth. But I tell you that everyone will give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken. That really hit me uh, as I looked at it because I realized sometimes I'll say things and I'm like, man, why did I say that? That was kind of um, crass or that was kind of you know inappropriate or something like that. Uh, and God says here, you're, you're, by your words, you'll be acquitted and by your words, you'll be condemned. Now, we shouldn't feel shame and guilt and go, oh no, I could never be forgiven. Because again, Jesus is offering, once we realize we've said, hey, Lord, I've said the wrong things, heal my tongue. Uh, Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And so God touched, sent an angel and, and touched him with a coal from his fire. This is a story in Isaiah. And it actually changed how he spoke. In other words, God puts his word in him. He puts his spirit in us. When his presence comes, it kind of burns out all the junk so that we can live in his light, right? Um, another example of that is the idea of uh, photosensitivity. If you remember before Steve Jobs came and destroyed all the cameras in the world, there used to be cameras that had film in them. And when you have film, uh, if you are not, it's unprocessed film and you took a bunch of pictures, but then I was, were, was to hold it up to one of these lights. There's very bright lights in here. If I did that, 
the image is photosensitive. In other words, when that light starts hitting it, the image actually burns away. And, you know, sin's like that too. Uh, when we've said wrong things, when we've done wrong things, when we realize we've made choices that don't honor God, uh, when we bring those things to him and to his light and we just don't hide them, we don't make excuses, we just bring them to him, his light actually burns that stuff away and makes us new. Now, to some of the Pharisees who were there, they said, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, this is to me the ultimate, okay, he, he made a guy who couldn't see and couldn't talk, see and talk. He healed a shriveled hand. They've seen him at this point, if they've been following him around, they've seen him do hundreds of miracles. And they go, well, can we see a sign then? If you're really so good and you're really so true, he's done a bunch of signs. What is going on? So now Jesus has had enough. He answered, it is a wicked and adulterous generation that asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now the prophet Jonah jumping at what, what is Jesus talking about? What, where is he going here? And this is why this message makes sense on Resurrection Sunday. Because what Jesus was speaking about is this. Jonah was inside the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. In the exact same way, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's promising you that what happened with Jonah hundreds of years previously in a place called Nineveh, uh, well, actually in the sea on his way to Nineveh or his way running away from Nineveh, but in the same way that he was in this great fish three days, that was a prophetic picture that the sin of the whole world was going to come on Jesus and he was going to go into the earth for three days. And then he was going to rise from the dead. And then he makes this statement, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at even just the preaching of Jonah. And now someone greater than Jonah is here. Here's what I don't want us to miss on this special resurrection Sunday. Jesus really did come. He really is God, but he did really live a life as a man for 33 years. He took on himself all our sin, all our shame, the punishment for everything wrong we've ever done. It was all put on him. He promised it. He prophesied about it. Isaiah prophesied about it. Jonah prophesied about it. Daniel prophesied about it. All kinds of people hundreds of years earlier prophesied about this man coming. When he died, uh, all our sin died with him. Three days later, when he rose from the dead, he was showing he had conquered death. He had conquered hell. He had conquered sin. And he could offer new life to anyone who believed in him. He didn't actually skirt around the laws that were written in the Old Testament. He actually fulfilled all of them so that you and I could be made righteous by the law, by our own conscience, before God, before men. We could stand clean and unashamed because of the work of Jesus. And we can trust he can forgive us and make us new because he's already defeated the, the greatest enemy of them all, that is death. So let me summarize what I've said to you uh, on this Resurrection Sunday service. First of all, Jesus sets clear priorities for us. He desires mercy, not sacrifice. Sometimes we miss it by, by focusing on rules and regulations rather than doing good and helping those in need. Uh, sometimes we got to break out of our religious expectations and realize, hey, what would be actually the best for the other person? Because Jesus is all about relationship, not just religion. Now, he's not saying religion is bad. Religion is kind of what we do uh, in response to uh, trying to honor or do right before God. But he's saying that only comes out of a relationship with God where you know his heart. So you're doing things not just at the letter level, but at the spirit of why God wants you to do things. Now, religion's response to God saying all those things, first of all, they tried to kill him. They tried to kill his compassion. It's unlawful to do good on the Sabbath. You don't want to help people who are hungry eat. You don't want to uh, help people who are sick be healed. You want to just sit there and do nothing because that's more honorable somehow. We haven't figured out why, but that's what they seem to say. They question Jesus' authority. Who gives you the right to make these decisions? Well, God does because he's God. They accuse even the spirit that's at work in Jesus. They say you're doing this for evil spirit reasons, not godly reasons. And so that's how sometimes we respond when someone does something good, does something noble, does something led by the spirit, but it's different than our experience. You know, in church history, often the greatest persecutors of new moves of God are people who were part of old moves of God. And then 30 years later, 40 years got later, God is moving in a new way that's different than how he did it before. Uh, so as I move from being part of this generation to being part of the previous generation, uh, I need to learn that God might be doing a new thing because his mercies are new every morning and because he's always doing a new thing. And so I need to trust that God's still on the move 
and God's still doing new things and we can trust the new thing he's doing. As long as we discern, it's the spirit of him at work. How would we know it's his spirit? Mercy is triumphing over sacrifice. Doing good is more important than rules and regulations. All these things that we see. Jesus's response. He manifests both mercy and sacrifice. I don't know if you noticed, but it said his disciples were eating. Jesus wasn't. Jesus was fully fulfilling the law with no question and no personal interest. And yet these guys, both mercy and sacrifice were needed. Jesus lives that out. He offers his body as a living sacrifice every single step of his life. And he exercises mercy everywhere he goes. Jesus does good and fulfills the law and the prophets. He doesn't make us decide between rules and regulations or doing good. He actually fulfills both so that by faith in him, we fulfill the law, we fulfill the rules and regulations, and he empowers us by his spirit to do good. Finally, he's restoring relationship between God and humanity. When we know God, when we walk with God, when we walk in his light, then we have fellowship with one another, the Bible teaches, that helps us love one another. And the blood of Jesus, God's son, cleanses us from all our sins so that we can live the way we were supposed to live. Now, as I close our service today, I want to just remind you guys to take communion uh, at some point, uh, either individually or as a family, if you can. Uh, the reason we do this is to celebrate exactly what happened over this weekend. Jesus on the Passover took bread, he broke it, gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. The way you're going to find life is by not finding it in yourself, but by finding it in Jesus. He said, I am your life. And if you'll receive this, it'll be healing to you. And then he took a cup and he said, there's a new covenant. There's a new rules and regulations. Your role, believe in me, follow me, trust me. Jesus's role, die on the cross for our sins, rise from the dead three days later, ascend into heaven, come back with a kingdom, lead us, pray for us, be our Lord, be our guide, be our life, be our sacrifice, be our all. That he could change us and make us a new creation. We celebrate that as we take communion. So as you can take some time either individually or as a family to do that sometime today and celebrate who Jesus is. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you, Pastor Josh, for the word of encouragement. And even as we come to the close of our service, just a couple of announcements for the coming weekend. In this coming uh, Friday, with our monthly prayer and worship night, come and join us 7.30 p.m. at City Hub in Hall A. Come and join us to pray and worship and magnify God together. And then on Saturday, the 6th of April, is our monthly Mandarin Fellowship as well. If you're Mandarin speaking or you have friends, colleagues, family members who are Mandarin speaking, come and join us for this time. All are welcome. And on Sunday, the 7th of April, is part one of our foundation series. Come and sign up for this. It's a two-part series, 7th April and 14th of April. It's on Sundays, 1.30 to 4 p.m. You can just scan the QR code and register online. And if you'd like to just give your tithe and offering as worship to God, likewise, scan the QR code and you can give online as well. So God bless you. Have a great week ahead. Lift you high, you are all the